We give you the praise today. We give you the glory today. Father, I pray that you would stir every heart that is in this room, that today you would encounter them, today that you would do something supernatural in the ground of their heart, Lord, that today you would awaken callings and destinies and purposes and dreams in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. It's a privilege to be back in these halls again. I live in Orlando, Florida now. And uh, it's great to be up here. We got some family that has traveled from Michigan and the, in the surrounding area as well. And so I honor you guys for coming. Some of my former students, I was a youth pastor in this state back in the day, so I got a few of them here. But I honor all you guys and give honor to you, Dr. Graham, Dr. Hagen, and the team. It's a privilege to be back with you. Um, today, I pray that you're going to be stirred and that you're going to be moved in Jesus' name. Are you ready? All right, we got a table out in the lobby in the back. On your way out, be sure to stop by there. We got some t-shirts there, and uh, I think Carly is here somewhere, and um, she's got a shirt here. Oh, yeah, come on up, Carly. You guys know Carly? Car Carly is my cousin, all right? She's my cousin here, and so she's a student. She's already a senior, and she's 19. How's that work, you know? PSEO, all right? But we got these shirts here. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Anybody wear an extra large? All right, I see one over there. You want to you wanna give it to her right there? <laughs> and um, you guys can uh, get one of those out in the lobby as well. But we're going to start in Mark chapter 3 today, if you want to open up your Bibles. Today I'm going to share a message with you that is for every person here that is in going into five-fold ministry, every person that is going into business. It does not matter what your field is. This will apply to you. Because, my friends, this is for everybody. This has been the cry of my heart. I have now been around the world ministering in 27 some odd countries. We have seen the blind see, the deaf hear, cripples walk. In fact, in Pakistan in September, we had 18 paralyzed people walk in one night. One night. They left their wheelchairs, they left their crutches, and they just left them on the fields. They didn't need them anymore. We watched 139 people delivered from demons in one night. Uh, just in that one meeting. Um, we've had so many blind people get healed that I can't keep track anymore, and the stories are just flooding in from around the world. We have over 50 miracle videos on our YouTube channel that we haven't even posted yet because there's too many to keep posting. It would be too much to do it every single day. So I tell you what, God is on the move around the world, and I don't know what you hear, but it's happening in the United States as well, and may it happen here today in Jesus' name. Uh, Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 13, Jesus went on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that they might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Here we have the calling of the apostles, the original 12. Jesus went on the mountainside and called to him those that he wanted. My friends, do you know that God wants you? He wants you. There, there was a verse that back in the day, many are called, few are chosen. I would stress out over this. Lord, am I one of your chosen ones? You know, I don't know if you've ever had that, but I, I even remember being in the North Central Halls over in Phillips Hall. They had a prayer room there on the second floor. And I, I went in there and I, I was crying out like, Lord, am I chosen? Am I chosen? I was calling out on this very campus. And one day it dawned upon me that in order to be chosen, I just simply had to say yes to what he wanted to do in my life. Because yes equals love to him, love equals obedience. My friends, has God called you? Then say yes. Then say yes, and my friends, you will be chosen for the task that he, he is calling you to do. But, but the, the thing here that in this passage that totally captivated my heart was that we always read the part about preaching the gospel and driving out the demons. We want the healing of the, the sick and the raising of the dead, right? Matthew 10, 8 says, heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. We want this. This is a testament and a demonstration of our great God in the earth. But there's a part here that we often miss. He went on the mountainside and called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him first to be with him. We always think of all of the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. But the first calling of the disciples was actually to come and to be with Jesus. 
My friends, you are walking the halls of so many legends that have come to this school and to this house, and they are all over the nations and all over the world speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. But my friends, we will flame out and we will die out and our flames will not be lit if we do not learn to fall in love with Jesus. Think about these disciples. I mean, what did they do? They went all around the nations with him. They went all around that area and they walked, they walked the Israeli area. They, they, they were preaching and telling the message of God's kingdom everywhere they went. These disciples ended up giving their very lives for this man. If he was, if he was a false messiah, they wouldn't have died for him. As soon as he died, they would have went on with their lives and disappeared. But there was something different about his message. There was something different about his kingdom and they were willing to give their very lives for him. Why? Because they knew him, because they were with him, because they were around the same campfires together. They broke bread together. Sure, they did ministry together, but think of all those conversations, walking up all the mountains and through all the valleys and those little times between transitions in the cities. Think of all those moments that aren't even written down there in scripture, John 21. If all of the miracles were written, I suppose the world would not have room for the books to be written. I mean, what were they even, what were they even talking about? I mean, I wish I could have peered into those conversations, but they were learning of him. They were learning to love him and to be with him and to enjoy him everywhere that they went. And after he was gone, after he ascended, after died and resurrected and ascended, they carried on his message into the earth. And they were willing to give their lives for him. My friends, Jesus was the supreme, most important thing in their lives. And they were willing to do anything for him. Sure, the preaching of the gospel came. Sure, the driving out of the demons came. Sure, all of the miracles came. But it was first because they fell in love with Jesus. I remember crying out many times in these, in these altars and the praise gatherings. Do you guys still do that on Wednesdays? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I used to love those. I, I, would, I would do everything. I was like the last one to leave every week. I wanted to be in the presence of God. I just loved his presence. But it's these seasons where maybe you feel overlooked. Maybe you're not the one that's up on the stage. Maybe you don't, you're not the one that's preaching or getting the opportunities in the student-led chapels. Maybe, maybe you feel like overlooked in this season. It's not even about all that. It's not even about which degree you're doing right now or the five majors you're flipping before you're in your first or second year. It doesn't matter. Like Those are things that God will reveal in his timing, but it is about being with Jesus. It is about enjoying him and loving him and, and learning to love his presence. And these disciples first came to him to be with him, and then everything else came. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, if you want to flip there. This is uh, one of my favorite passages. As an evangelist, I get to travel and preach a lot of gospel messages. You know, the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But it's the power of God unto salvation. And the same power that is in the gospel is the same power that is freeing people all across the world. And my friends, it is still the truth for today. The culture isn't the truth. The news isn't the truth. All the stuff isn't the truth. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the answer to what the world needs. We carry that message within us. Anybody have the Holy Spirit? Oh yeah, the kingdom of God is is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, right? Where's the Holy Spirit? He's in us, right? So he wants to get out. (laughs) We got to let him out. We got to let him do what only he can do. I was, I was, I love the Holy Spirit. He's become He's become, might as well be my best friend. I don't know how else to say it. I just love him so much. I've learned to, learned to get to know him, and uh, you know, I can't wait to keep getting to know him. But here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, one time he spoke to me, and he said, Caleb, I want you to read Revelation 3, 20. I said, oh, Holy Spirit, I know that verse. I'm an evangelist. I preach this one around the world, man. We have seen tens of thousands of people come to Christ because of this verse, you know. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and be with him and he with me, or I will eat with him and he with me. I will come and sup with him and he with me, depending on the version you're reading. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, if, you, if anybody here is going to have kids, you're probably going to say, hey, where's Jesus at? You know, oh, he's going to come into your heart, right? We all tell them that. My kids, I do this with them. Where's Jesus? Oh, he's in my heart. That's right. Because he's on the door of your heart. He's knocking. You know, this is, this is what we tell our kids. This is how we, a way we can understand it. This is a way we preach the gospel in a very childlike, simple way. But one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, read it again. I said, I, I know this verse, Holy Spirit. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. You're missing it. Missing it? I know this verse. I haven't memorized since I was a little kid. Read it again. Okay. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. You're still missing it. Holy Spirit, are you, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> I don't understand. What am I missing here? I'm reading it over and over and over again, and he just keep, continues to come after me with this verse. And I, he's like, you're, there's something you're not getting. And finally, I got a little bit smart, and I said, I said, okay, Holy Spirit. I said, I, I don't uh, seem to be catching what you're laying down here. So I said, can you just tell me what it is you're trying to say? He said, sure. <laughs> And in that moment, he said something that has changed my life. He said, Caleb, the knocking never stops. Wait, 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 what? I read it again. And suddenly, something changed about everything in my life that I thought that I understood about the Holy Spirit, about Jesus coming and visiting you know, we are in a Bible school, a university. We are going around the world. There's probably 500 some odd ministry students in here. There's probably 500 that are going into business. I don't know all the exact numbers, but, but we, are, we are a people of his presence and of his glory, and we must manifest his kingdom in the earth and bring it in Jesus' name. But, but there's something about this verse that, that started to get to me because I said, Holy Spirit, Jesus is standing at the door of my heart. He's knocking. He's knocking. He's knocking. And I said, yes, I already, I already gave my life to Jesus. I tell people about him everywhere. I spend time with him all the time. But, but something inside of the way I thought and my thought process said that I had already done that verse. I checked it off. I've already asked Jesus to come in my heart and to be with me. I've already had a meal with him and shared that moment. I've already come to him in salvation, and I've had this amazing moment with him. And he began to minister to me over the course of the next hour and a half, and I was just weeping before the Lord because I started to think about all the times that he would come and he would knock on my heart again. And I would miss his coming. I would miss his invitation. I would miss this diving into intimacy with the Lord. I mean, think about all those times with the disciples. They, they went all, all around the world with him. Think of all those conversations they have. They didn't just check the box. They were together all the time, everywhere, in his presence. They were a people of his presence. And my friends, I, I, I say to you today, you cannot live this life without Jesus and responding to his invitation every single moment of every single day. He says to pray without ceasing. How is that possible? You know, that would bother me all the time until I realized that prayer wasn't just a one-sided thing. It was actually him speaking to me too. It was being aware of his presence and building that connection. I mean, what are they doing now? 5G and whatever. Like it's, like, it's almost like this. You have this connection with the Lord and you're tuning into his presence and into his spirit at all moments of all days to respond to him wherever it is he's leading you. It's not just about preaching on a platform. It's not just singing a song. It's learning to love him with all that you have. Matthew 13, 44 to 46, it says that the, the pearl of great price was buried in a field. And the man went and sold everything he had because he knew that that pearl was there. My friends, Jesus is that pearl of great price. You, you have to forsake all else to love him, to be with him, to know him. I've ministered to so many tens of thousands and now hundreds of thousands of people were we're planning a crusade in Pakistan in September. We're expecting 250,000 people in one night. We're, we're, it's our biggest budget we've ever had. We're, 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 we're making all of the things happen that we need to do right now to make that happen. 
And I'm sitting here with other conversations taking place by maybe 2021 that we might do a crusade with over a million people in one night. Lost people in a country that's 98% non-Christian. I could die in any of these given situations. I get that and I know that. But I've already lost my life. I've already given it to him. Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's right. There is a continual knocking from the door of your heart where Jesus says, come and be with me. I thought of all the times as I, as I read this, as I was going through this encounter with the Lord, where I would leave the moment before he was done speaking to me. I thought about all the church services I attended, even the praise gatherings, the chapels, all those moments where I would, I would leave that moment with him. And I was the one that was always leaving, you know, because he's not leaving me. I already, okay, God, I did, my, I did my, my, my you thing. I did my devotions. I spent time with you. And now I'm going to move on with my day and go do all the other stuff. And I just felt this prompting from the Holy Spirit that he's going with me too. And it's almost as if somebody follows you around all day and you don't ever say hi to them or something. They're with you. They eat dinner with you, lunch with you, breakfast, coffee, classes. They're going everywhere with you and you just never even say hi to them all the time. I started to realize he wants to speak to me all the time. He wants to do, uh, spend time with me and enjoy me and, and build relationship with me. And everything began to change in my life as I started to steward that relationship with him, to talk to him all the time, to respond to his knocking. Because Jesus went on the mountainside and called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him to be with him, my friends, because the knocking never stops. There's an invitation from the Lord. Flip over to Luke chapter 10 real quick. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. We have a, a fascinating passage here. It's the passage of, uh, of Mary and Martha. Verse 38, Jesus and his disciples were on their way, and he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is an amazing passage that gives insight into the heart of God. You know, Martha, I think, is a pretty cool person. She's doing everything she needs to do. She's what any pastor would want in their church. She's getting the potluck ready. She's going and getting all the invitations in the small group. She's going door to door for the evangelism stuff. She's getting everybody organized and ready. She even got Pastor Jesus, the local minister, to come to her house. I mean, come on, somebody. That's pretty cool. I think she's doing pretty good, right? She gets him to come. He comes, he's coming in, and she's getting everything ready. It doesn't even say she asked anybody to help her. She probably should have delegated a little bit more, probably would have helped her out, you know. But here, here she is with, with Mary, and she goes to Jesus and says, Lord, Lord, tell her to help me. She was distracted. She had too much going on. She was missing the moment of her visitation from the Lord, even though it was at her own home, even though she got him to come. He was coming, maybe with an answer to that prayer she had been praying. He was coming with an answer because he is the answer. He was coming with deliverance because he is deliverance. He was coming with hope because he is hope, because he's joy, because he's peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He is the word became flesh who was slain before the foundations of the world. My friends, he is the gospel. He is the power. He is the revelation. He is the joy set before us. My friends, he is Jesus, and we need him with every breath that we have. We're calling out to him. Many of us on our knees in this very altar saying, Lord, where are you? Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, answer my call. And when he comes so often, we're distracted by everything else. 
Ooh, look, there's something shiny over there. Ooh, look, this opportunity over there. Oh, look, that cute boy or the cute girl looked at me. Oh, my goodness, am I going to go on a date with them? What's going on? The church over here needs me. This volunteer thing. Should I go for the summer? Should I stay? We're, we're distracted. And every single day we miss that moment to spend time with him. When he just knocks, he says, hey, you want to spend some time with me? Oh, I don't have time for that right now, God. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. I got to get my homework done. I got to go over to the church. I got to go volunteer. My friends are hanging out tonight. I'll do it later when I get back. Hey, do you want to spend time with me? I'll do it some other time, God. And we miss him. And we miss him. And we miss him. And he's coming at that moment of visitation for you potentially with the life-changing encounter you have been praying for and crying for all of your life. He tells Martha something in that moment, and he says, Martha, you are worried and upset and distracted about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen it, and it won't be taken away from her. One thing is needed. Now, if Jesus says something to you, I mean, I think that's pretty important, right? He gives us a revelation in this moment. What does he say? One thing is needed. One thing. One thing is necessary. What was it? What was the one thing? It's just a couple of verses before. What is it? Mary was just sitting at his feet. She was listening to him. She was hanging on his every word. What does Peter say? Are you going to leave too? No, Lord. You alone have the words of eternal life. Where else would I go? We're looking for answers everywhere else. When all the while, the man with the eyes of the fire looks at you, and extends his hand out to you. He says, come with me. I'm going to send you and you're going to preach the gospel. You're going to drive out the demons. You're going to heal the sick and raise the dead. But who's willing to come with me? Is there anybody out there that wants to come and give their life to me? Is there anyone who wants to come and be with me? Is there anyone who wants to respond to my knocking? And we miss him, miss him, miss him. North Central, this is the time in the season to forsake all else for the joy of knowing Jesus, for the joy of knowing him. I can't tell you how many times I've come back to my room in, in hotels or motels or little huts or ground or like bugs everywhere, and I've, I've given my life to this thing, and sometimes you don't get to stay in a nice place, <laughs> Sometimes you think you're going to die in the room. It's more dangerous because of the 18 mosquitoes flying around in the one room. You don't think you're going to make it to the morning. And I come back after these moments where tens of thousands have responded to Jesus. And I get on my knees and I say, Lord, thank you for the paralyzed walking. Thank you for the, the blind seeing. Thank you for demonstrating your power. Thank you for saving my life yet again when those guys walked in with guns again. Thank you for, 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 for sparing me so I could come back home to see my wife and my three little kids who I love with all my heart. Thank you for another opportunity to give them a hug and to tell them I love them. Thank you for releasing your kingdom in this pagan nation where missionaries have gone long before, one or two at a time, and prayed for somebody to come. And I stand on the ground of their tears and on their prayers. And I get to reap what so many before me have, have forsaken and given their very lives for. And to watch tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands come to Christ. But when I get back to my room, I thank him for those things. And I get on my knees and I say, but Jesus, it's all about you. My favorite part of the day isn't even reaping that harvest. Can I tell you that? You need to hear this. Got a minute left, and we're going to open these altars up. 
But if you got one minute left and you have to go, you're going to get there in about one minute. And listen to me. This is worth your everything. He is worth your everything. The power and the miracles and the signs and the wonders and the opportunities, they will come. But the best part of your day, the best part of your life, is spending time with the one that you love. Because, my friends, the bridegroom is coming, the king is coming, the judge is coming, Jesus is coming back, and he's going to take his bride without spot or wrinkle, and I can't wait. But can I tell you something? I once heard Banning Leapster say this. It was, it, was, it was one of my favorite quotes, and then I added something to it. But he said, those who make Jesus, th- those who are famous with Jesus in the secret place will be the ones allowed to make Jesus famous in the earth. And I was like, come on, somebody. And then wh- after this revelation, this is what happened. I said, and they won't care. <laughs> Because it isn't about all that. It's about being in relationship with the one you love. When my my wife truly, her favorite place to be is with me. It's crazy. I don't know. Like, she doesn't, Australia, Israel, all the stuff, she wants to do all that too. But if you ask her where she wants to be, I just want to be wherever Caleb is. (laughs) It's pretty incredible. You guys are going to find that here. All you guys looking for your spouses and your MRS degree and all that. You're going to get that. (laughs) I'll prophesy it in Jesus' name. (laughs) It's all going to come. It's all going to come. But when you fall in love with Jesus, everything about your life will change. If you want to stand to your feet, it's 1140. It's actually 1139, so you're getting out of one minute early. If you have to go, you are free to be dismissed. If you want to linger, I'm going to continue to pray. And you're welcome to come to these altars. I'm going to lay hands on people, anybody that wants prayer. But some of you, you don't even need that. (laughs) Because Jesus can lay hands on you himself. He can take care of everything you've been praying for. It's time to repent and to come back to your first love. To give him everything that you have. And to stop stressing about all these things right now that are going to get taken care of. Don't worry. The real thing you need to answer is, did you love Jesus today? Did you give him your all today? Did you say yes to what it is he's asking you to do? These altars are open. Father, right now I I just call out to you in Jesus' name as some are leaving. God, and I just declare right now in the name of Jesus for Holy Spirit, for you to come and to minister to people right where they are, Lord. Bring us back to our first love, Lord. I release visions right now in Jesus' name that eyes would be open to see your beautiful face that people would see those eyes of fire, that they would see the man in white that that the Pakistanis and the Indians and the Sri Lankans have been seeing in their homes when they've been calling out for something that's real. And, And the man in white appears in their room, Lord. This is you, Jesus. I declare visions right now from the Lord. Calls, destiny, purpose, revelation, the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come. Father, right now, I declare in bodies all around this room, those that are dealing with sickness and disease, I declare healing power right now in Jesus' name to flood into their bodies in Jesus' name. Father, I just declare right now from head to toe that every ailment, every sickness, every disease would be completely driven out of their bodies right now. Father, I curse diabetes. I curse cancer right now in Jesus' name. For people that are dealing with breathing issues, I curse it right now. Allergies, Lord, be gone in Jesus' name. I pray right now for those that are, uh, some people that have been injured in sports injuries in previous seasons with football, basketball, track, and these things, God. I just pray for a reversal of what the bone has done, that it would be made whole in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for new body parts to come in where things have been completely undone, Lord. Right now, I declare over the deaf, Lord, that there would be ears to hear in Jesus' name. Eyes to see for the blind, Lord, that you would minister over the heart of every single person that is here. Lord, I pray that you would begin to sweep through our midst and to capture us again, that we would be burning, burning, burning with desire for Jesus, that we would respond to your knocking. 
Lord, that you would do something in us that cannot be changed or shaken, Lord, that you would encounter our life right now in a moment of visitation.